Barcelona before uh, a really large conference was there called the Mobile World Con Congress. And so we, uh, we created this visualization as in a partnership with BBVA, a bank. They gave us a bunch of information about how much transactions had happened in the city during the same times of days on, the week, on a week that wasn't during the conference versus when it was during the conference. And so this was a map that was created using a library we are developing called Torque. Um, we've never had a, a really uh, official version for Torque um, because it's something that I, I developed and I have to say I'm pretty far from an engineer. So uh, it, it, we're working right now to actually make a version one and uh, we've made a lot of new improvements and we're, we're hoping to publish uh, um, some information about the data schema. We use a really efficient data schema for transferring temporal data to the web and then pulling that schema back apart and doing some really interesting visualizations uh, so you can check out that one online if you want, um, it's a URL. And so a lot of people, because they see those things, they still associate CartoDB with just maps. And that's really nice, but it, it's a lot more than that. CartoDB is built on PostgreSQL and PostGIS. It has a SQL API, so you can write straight SQL statements to your CartoDB account and to any table you put on CartoDB. So you can do some really powerful queries to manipulate, your, manipulate data, filter your data, and, and pull that data to the web. And so the SQL API gives you your data in JSON format by default, but you can, you can actually just ask for uh, GeoJSON, you can ask for um, CSVs, KMLs, all these other things. And because it's built on PostGIS, it handles well-known text, well-known bi binary, but if you use, say, the GeoJSON format, it will um, convert your, your geometry stored in the database into, uh, into GeoJSON for you. Makes it really easy to build web applications and build your data into, the, into your web apps. And so the data that you pull out of CartoDB doesn't have to go into maps. So we do like a lot of little tests and demos using D3. It's a really fun one to build graphs of your data. And so this is for a pending blog post I have about some contributions to a citizen science project we've been developing uh, and the rate of those contributions over time. So this is just pulling the live data from CartoDB. So anytime you were to look at this graph, it would be updated um, with the newest information, which is a really nice thing about CartoDB is everything that you build from it using the APIs are dynamic and uh, reflect directly your, your, mo your latest data. So CartoDB also handles really well data in. It's built for, for you to build data visualizations and maps on top of it, but it also has the API set up so that you can put data back into your table, or into your table, so your, your data can grow. And so an example that we did um, recently was uh, we used the Barcelona um, government has a, a data API where every 15 minutes they publish the latest information about street con congestion in town. And uh, I was really excited to see the talks earlier today about um, tying street traffic to uh, OSM data. I mean, it's, it's just an obvious thing, and I've always been really excited to think about those things, but I've never quite known how to do it myself. And so this one actually, uh, the Barcelona government publishes the line strings with the traffic information. So I had thought when I was putting this talk together that maybe I'd try to reconcile those to OpenStreetMap and, and rebuild this map. But I just didn't have time to do that. But you can get an idea of how that would happen quite quickly. But so what we did is we just built a little, a little um, essentially a cron job on an app, app, app engine app, app that every 15 minutes grabbed the data from the Barcelona data API and stuck it into a table in CartoDB. And then on top of that table, we had our map that had our, our streets. And each of those streets had a style in Carto CSS that the style was just defined based on how much traffic was on that, on that line string. So every time that that App Engine app dropped new line string information into the table, this map reflect, reflected that live data. So any user that went to this, they would always see the most um, recent traffic information at, at most 15 minutes old. And so CartoDB does a really nice job at building those, or allowing you to build those dynamic maps that just change. And uh, it handles all the caching and all those um, sorts of import, important performance layers for you. So every 15 minutes we had a map. Okay, so that gets me to OSM and CartoDB and some of my explorations for, for this talk. Uh, one thing that I want to talk about really quickly is how uh, CartoDB supports OpenStreetMap. Uh, you can import right now uh, OSM data. Of course, you can import Impossum data. Uh, it's just shape files. And so I think uh, real quick, I'll just show you in case you've never had a chance to use CartoDB. Here's, um, here's my CartoDB account. This is my dashboard for... Uh, for all the data sets that I've loaded in the past. And here's uh, some Impossum exports. So if I go down to the San Francisco uh, roads, I'm just going to make an archive of that. And then I'm going to put it in my account. 
the reason I'm doing this is we're going to come back and use this in a second, too. I just want to show something. So another thing, if you haven't used CartoDB, um, what it's doing here in the back in the back is it's putting in the database, and it's also building some common indexes for you, so the data works really fast. It's handling reprojecting all this so that it's always in WGS84 uh, geometries, so that that way we can build the maps really quickly too, because we already we already know what's happening there. So here's the maps of all my streets from OpenStreetMap. I can get rid of this. Okay, let me see it a bit better. All right, so we'll come back and we'll use that in a minute and um, to do some other interesting things. But yeah, and actually it handles um, multi-file import too. So actually if I had just had a zip of that entire impossum dump, th that's what I did here. I uh, uploaded that zip of all the San Francisco data and it just created all those different tables for me. So it makes it really quick. And um, I have a slide later that's going to say this. So, but. 2.1 uh, is coming soon, and 2.1 is going to make it really easy for you to take each of those layers and put them back into a single visualization. And so I, was, I, I would love to talk to you a bit about that today, but we're um, still maybe a couple weeks away from launching that. So, um, so our tile-based rendering uh, on CartoDB can handle one to many layers. So depending on how well you can see that, this is actually, um, this is actually the OSM dump for California. And I'm putting all the layers back together so it has land usage, uh, roads, um, areas of interest. And so CartoDB is making this map with uh, a single tile that's then combining all those different layers, or in, or in San Francisco that zoomed in there a bit. So yeah, 2.1 is right on the corner, and we're going to have some really, really cool stuff going on there. OK. So once you have your OSM data, if, if you saw my talk uh, last year, I showed these a couple things that I've been working on. But once you have your OSM data in CartoDB, the thing that's really interesting about it is you can use the SQL to do some, some really interesting things with it. So this one I wrote um, a, a naive k-means cluster. So I took points of interest and I, and I clustered them just to look at what some, what some hypothetical clustering of these points are. Um, Another example that I like to show, and this one I actually had created last year for this, for this meeting, was uh, I had the, uh, the polygons of, of Portland around the convention center where this meeting was. And I wrote a piece of SQL that would reorder these polygons and then draw them on the map based on their shape. And so that's the SQL. And the style is just actually uh, is just coloring them. And so that happens on the fly. And you can do that from the client. We have a JavaScript uh, library. Um, so you can use cartodb.js to run the SQL to hit your server and draw that on, on the tiles for you, and then the tiles are put on the map. And so this is just a slippy map that you would normally see, but here it's totally um, outside the perspective of, of the maps that we usually get. Um, and I used that uh, last, last week or two weeks ago for FOS4G. I did, a, I did a little demo on letting people write uh, anonymously to a table that I had created, and I asked them what the what the shape of Minneapolis was, and I got a lot of creative examples here that I really liked. Uh, yeah, and I have to say that that map's been censored, so. Um, but, uh, so now a little bit about vector rendering, because this is really interesting, and I, I, when I had been thinking a bit, well, actually let me, I'll, I'll, I'll make those statements in a bit, but uh, here's one data set uh, of New York streets, and this is uh, using a vector rendering library called Vecnic. Uh, and I'll show you um, a little bit more about Vicnik as we go forward here. And so this was just a style that um, one of my colleagues, Javier Santana, came up with, and he, he really likes maps that look like kind of sketched, hand-sketched maps. And so this styling is all being applied on the client using uh, Vecnic. And Vecnic, what he did uh, to build Vecnic is he it's, uh, it uses a subset of the Carta CSS rules to style these layers, and you just apply those with JavaScript. And so if you go to visuality slash Vecnic, you can see some of that stuff. Actually, I'll, I'll pull some of that stuff up now because it's actually really quite, some of his other um, examples are quite interesting. So this is another one of his uh, sort of sketchy examples. And uh, this one, this one shows how you can take that. And because all the data is now in the client here being rendered on this slippy map, so all the vectors are here, he has a set of styles that are being applied that are going and creating this blue to red. And so you could actually use JavaScript to apply those incrementally. 
And so this is, this is still my slippy map. And because that's in the, that's in the client, that's happening really, really fast. Um, and so I, th I think he launched, I think he put Vecnic out almost a year ago, maybe more, I don't know. Um, but he's been working on it recently to make it a bit better. And so I, I started playing with it a bit for this talk, and I'll come back to that. Um, so what about dynamic data? So that's what, that's what this talk was really about. Um, so one of the things that I started trying to think about, like what dynamic data would be interesting to combine with open paths, or uh, sorry, with uh, open street map data. And I, I, I was like, well, what are, some, what are some really big data sets that change a lot that will be interesting to see on streets or block level? And obviously my mind went to like Twitter and a lot of those other kind of um, usual suspects. And I just was kind of, I was kind of bored and I thought you would get bored if I showed you some of those things. So I was trying to think of some new ideas of what, what to show you. So if anybody uses open paths, I'm sure that there's quite a number of people here that use open paths. Uh, basically, it's a, it runs a very efficient little program on your phone, and it checks in your location to a database that then you own. So I have a set of I have a set of my locations for the last year or so that are online, and I can I can download them as, as I want. But they're not being created to share with any business or anything. It's just for me. Um, so I downloaded my data set from the last. A month or a couple months or something, and I and I cropped it to New York. To New York, so you can see that I have um, some biases about neighborhoods that I'm hanging out in New York. Um, I have where I work, I have where I live, I have where I go to eat and uh, wear fancy hats and things. Um, but uh, so then I took some OpenStreetMap data for the roads of New York, the same one that I showed you on the vector rendering. And I just was curious if I could do things like analyze which roads I'm likely using the most in New York. What are the most important routes? Um, so I just picked a simple algorithm because I know that I know that especially in New York, where the GPS is bouncing off buildings and things like that, it's getting my location quite wrong at times. Other times, it's doing great. Um, but I created a, I just created an other, another column in the OpenStreetMap table that I had uploaded, and uh, I call it my Open Paths score. And I came up with a very, very simple algorithm. And it just says, um, because I'm not sure 100% if I have a point on a road, I say every time that a road is the closest to my point, I'll give it 60% of my score for that point. Uh, and then I think it's like 30% and then 20% uh, for the second and third closest road to a point. And so I use this sort of weighting to try to like, just try to guess what the most, uh, what, what roads I'm using when, I'm, when my phone checks in. And so then all I do is I do a select all from the roads now that my open path score is greater than zero. And my map goes to that. And so that's kind of the like, that's how the dynamic part of CartoDB works. You can send a SQL query to your full data set and have it change the tiles that you're looking at right away. And so these, these are the routes that I've been on or near. And actually some of these are really interesting to me because I can see I can see like the path that I bike quite quite or the the route that I take quite often when I bike from home to Williamsburg and things like that, and it's getting it, and I, I found that quite found that quite interesting. And then I, I just was starting to play with could I make actually a um, core pleth sort of uh, uh, map of of the roads that I'm using the most, and I, I think actually um, I try I tried to like downweight the ones that I'm not using much, but when I started looking at this, I was actually I was quite impressed at the ones that it was nailing um, as being really important streets for me. But so then I started thinking, I was like, well, that's not, that's not actually like super interesting. <laughs> so sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I, so I went back to like playing with the vectors again. I was like, well, the vectors, everybody this year is going to be really excited about vectors. So what can I do with OpenStreetMap data and, and some, changing, some changing variable on the OpenStreetMap data? And I've seen stuff like this done before. Um, but I needed real-time data again, and I just wasn't, I wasn't allowed to use some of the real-time data that I'm seeing right now um, that are, that's coming from other people. And I was really excited, and I, was, I thought some of these projects would be ready to go. But I, I can't use some of that for this talk. And there's other, other places, like the Twitter, I was bored with it. So there's one place that always is real-time. And I was like, can I just use the sun data and put it on OpenStreetMap? And I was like, OK. And a lot of people have done this with the shadows and stuff. But I, was, I, I, um, I, I had been talking at FOS4G with Vlad who put together a leaflet, and he has a really cool JavaScript library that will give you, based on your lat long and a time, it will give you awesome variables about the sun. So uh, yeah, so leaflet, that guy. So I uh, wanted to show you this real quick, because um, this is using the same Vecnic library for the um, client-side rendering. 
sorry. So what this is going to do is, uh, when I hit start, it's it's going to um, it's going to play. Uh, <laughs> what I said is, I every time that it's drawing the line that is a road for OpenStreetMap, it's measuring the angle that road is, and then at that time, it's also seeing if that if that angle is close to what the angle of the sun is in the city, and it just plays through the day. And so, yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> okay, and it's not perfect. I have to tell you, I made this yesterday, okay? Um, and this is, this, is a, this is an interactive map that you can zoom in on and everything. And actually, Javi Santana is, our, is the JavaScript whiz, so I just emailed him today, and I was like, can you make this fast? But uh, he, was a, he hasn't gotten back to me yet. So, um, so now what I wanted to say was like, well, could, I mean, that's generic. I could do that for anything. So I don't know if you saw this down here. This is in the bottom left. This is my table name. So we uploaded, we just uploaded this to CartridgeDB at the beginning of the talk. I'm going to make my table public, and then... I'm going to go over here now. OK, well, look at that. That's the, that's the table I just uploaded. OK, so that's us in San Francisco. Now another, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, another, another thing to admit here is that this time is going to be New York time. But otherwise, it should, otherwise it should be just um, a couple hours off. So here we're, instead of at 8, it's at 9 in the morning, it's 6.30, whatever. OK? Ten minutes, cool, perfect. Okay, but then that uh, that uh, well, that, that was interesting, right? So I was like, I was like, but that's actually really cool to me because in New York, have you ever heard of Manhattan Hinge? It, it happens a couple times a year where the sun aligns with the grid, and we saw it when I played that. We saw when when I played that video of um, of New York, or not the video, the map of New York. When I played the map of New York, we saw that some at some point up here. It actually lines up with all these grids, and, and, we ha and it's super red across the grids when the sun is setting. And so, um, so I was like, well, that's pretty cool, but there's a Manhattan Henge like every day of the year in New York. So I don't know like, why we get super excited about it happening in Midtown. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there's got to be some really great ones. So what I did next was I, uh, I changed from like, this, this one that plays every like, 10 minutes of the day to one that plays every sunset of the year. And what's really cool here is, uh, as I play it, it's, it actually like skips every five days or so. But what you can see is like, there's not only Manhattan henges, but there's like Greenpoint henge, there's Brooklyn henge, there's Queens henge, like all this other stuff. So I was like, that's pretty fun, that's cool, that's, right. that's great. So now OpenStreetMap is like showing me some really interesting th things about the city I live in that I've never seen before. And so actually I wanna like polish this up a bit so that I can like just look at it each day and see, uh, see where I need to head to to watch the sunset. I thought that was really neat. Um, but yeah. Oh, wow, thank you. Uh, yeah, so that was, that was the point there. So uh, yeah, so anyway, thanks for letting me uh, watch, or let me show you some experiments that I had with OSM and get you thinking about using CartoDB and some of the things that we're up to. And if you have any questions or want to see any URLs, um, shoot me an email or Twitter. Thanks. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know that well, I don't know what your um, I don't know what your position is, but you know we give it away for free for students and nonprofits. Is there anybody in here that wants that? Um, as far as the pricing, I don't know. I'm not. I don't really pay attention to those conversations. But if shoot me an email, and I'm happy to like talk talk to you about anything. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, that's funny. One of the things I was one of the data sets I looked at was a couple of people monitoring um, rivers and uh, different different measurements of chemicals in rivers, and so I wanted to kind of make a visualization of real time, the measurement changing, and then showing that going down the river to see where it hits other places. But I, I, I couldn't find anything that I really love. But if you have any data sets that you're like keen to see happen, just point me towards them, and I'll make experiments with them for sure. Cool. Anything else? Do I have time for one more?
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so. Thanks very much.